Welcome back to the Sentinel Report. I'm Alex Newman, your host. Uh, as promised, we have two very special guests joining us today. I do hope you'll support our advertisers, folks. They're the ones who keep us on the air. Go to Greater Than I Ministries. Get that biblical worldview series. It's phenomenal. Go to my store or mypillow.com and use that promo code Newman. Some great products for your home, and you can support this show. Uh, our guests today, Dr. Ned Nikolov and Darwin Throne. Uh, I first came across Dr. Nikolov in 2017. He had published a study. The study was called New Insights on the Physical Nature of the Atmospheric Greenhouse Effect, deduced from an empirical planetary temperature model. And, uh, you know, not being a scientist, um, I struggled a little bit to get through the paper. So I reached out to a bunch of climate scientists and experts that I knew and asked them what they thought about this. Well, I was pleasantly surprised when I got quite a few responses saying, hey, this is interesting. This is intriguing. Wow, maybe this guy's on to something. Uh, so I wrote an article about it, and it was in uh, World Net Daily. Reagan, if you could throw that up, that'd be great. Uh, this was in 2017 again, uh, almost six years ago now, and we put that all over the place. That that article ended up getting uh, super widespread distribution. It was picked up by dozens and dozens of major websites. Uh, and and actually, the, the scientists involved challenged everybody, hey, if you have some reason why our paper is wrong, then come back and debunk it. Well, nobody has done that so far that I know of. So they're going to break this down for us. But in essence, what they're arguing is that the entire greenhouse gas theory, the idea that the planet is warming up because of greenhouse gases, is wrong. It's based on an incorrect understanding. So uh, Dr. Ned Nikolov, he is a federal scientist. He got a PhD in ecological modeling in 1997. He's got a master's um, and a bachelor's uh, in forestry. Uh, he's been working for the federal government as a scientist for, for many years. Uh, our other guest today who's working with Dr. Ned, he's not a co-author on that paper, but he's been involved in helping to promote this. So he's got lots of business and entrepreneurial experience. He serves as CEO. He has served as CEO and CFO of numerous companies. He's created companies, uh, president and CEO of Hondar, a manufacturer of wide area environmental data acquisition systems. He's also got experience in public service. His degree is in electrical engineering and a master's in physics. He's also on the served on the board of directors for scientific engineering up until 2003. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the program. It's uh, it's an honor to have you here. And um, I recognize you're, you're talking here not to scientists, but lay people. But uh, Dr. Nikolov, let's start with you. Uh, give us the essence of your findings and some of the evidence that you found to support your idea. Uh, you know, the easiest way to understand what we have found is uh, just to for the viewers to, to think about when they go up in a mountain hiking or they go up on an airplane in the middle of the summer, why it's getting cooler as you go up in elevation? And that's because it's known in atmospheric physics for a long time that this is because the air pressure drops. So uh, there is also other phenomenon called, for example, the Chinook winds that are well known. Um, uh, those are winds that are coming down, uh, down the mountain and they're being compressed. And this compression causes a heat, and those Chinook winds actually can uh, melt snow real fast. And um, so uh, we had this understanding already, and I, I started studying the greenhouse theory uh, just out of curiosity in about 2010 after the climate gate came out. And um, uh, knowing this effect about the pressure, I just had the idea of how we can find out if the pressure actually has to do anything with the uh, thermal effect of the atmosphere because, you know, from standard atmospheric physics, we know that as pressure drops with elevation, for example, the temperature drops as well in the troposphere. So what, what we did, we collected data uh, that the uh, NASA observations, the Vedic observations from uh, a number of planets, rocky planets that have rocky surfaces in the solar system. And we did an analysis called dimensional analysis, but basically it's uh, analyzing data in an objective way where you, um, where the, research, the, the researcher assumes that he or she doesn't know anything about the theory. So the, the analysis itself comes up with a relationship. And the relationship that we have discovered doing this analysis was uh, a pretty astonishing because it had the shape that has been known in other smaller systems here on Earth that people have um, uh, investigated, the relationship between temperature and pressure. But this was on a planetary scale, this was across the solar system, and this relationship, uh, uh, it, it's a little bit different from what people observe in a laboratory, but the shape of the curve was the same, and the accuracy of, with which this curve was able to describe the global temperatures of all those six rocky planets spanning the uh, distance from Venus 
uh, down to Triton, which is a you know pretty much almost the entire solar system in terms of conditions, atmospheric conditions and, and radiation conditions. Uh, we were able to derive an empirical function that actually describes the, the temperature of those planets, including Earth, very accurately, uh, only as a function of solar radiation reaching the planet and total amount of pressure. The main implication of this relationship was that for the thermal effect of the atmosphere, the composition does not matter. In other words, how much carbon dioxide you have, how much nitrogen you have, how much oxygen you have, it does not matter. The water vapor does have, that does have an effect, especially on Earth, because it's condensing gas. It evaporates and then it comes back down as rain. And the, the clouds turn out to be impacted by the solar activity one way or the other. So uh, the cloud cover, it does have a significant impact on the climate. Uh, however, the baseline temperature, which means like a long-term temperature of the Earth, say over the last thousand years, uh, it is describable very accurately by using only the pressure and uh, and the total radiation coming to the planet, and it's not only for Earth but for uh, another uh, five planets and moons in the solar system. Yeah, that is fascinating, uh, Dr. Nikolov. That's one of the things that so intrigued me about your paper is that you basically took this model, you looked at other celestial bodies in our solar system, and actually you found. Uh, very, very accurate readings for what you would expect based on this formula that you have with atmospheric pressure. Uh, it's it's just fascinating. Uh, Darwin, let's turn to you real quick. Uh, what are the implications? I, and I guess we should, before we get into the implications, um, what have been the challenges? I mean, has anybody published a peer-reviewed paper um, attacking your premises or attacking your work? Has there been any serious scientific challenge to what you're saying now? They've had six years, I guess, to work on it. What have they said? What have they published uh, to refute this? Nothing that we know of. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that you know of, Ned, is there? No, I'm not aware. Uh, there is a lot of blog articles which are not peer-reviewed that, uh, you know, people try to uh, argue without theory. But again, arguing without theory and saying this is a coincidence, they don't uh, deny the relationship that we discovered, but they say it's a coincidence. And then uh, uh, they could not explain how this relationship has all the features of a new physical law on a micro level. And, and so uh, there has been nothing actually in the period of literature. What's interesting is that the mainstream scientists that I tried to communicate with, and I have tried maybe about 200 scientists or so, sending emails, trying to engage in conversation, they basically refuse to engage in any discussion on that. They just, yeah. you know, the minute the conversation starts, it, they just uh, stop the communication. Yeah, and, and, so and I reached out to uh, I reached out to a lot of scientists around the world. I, you know, I've been covering the climate issue my entire career in journalism. I went to the first UN climate conference uh, that I went to. It was in 2009 in Copenhagen. So I know a lot of these guys, including a lot who are very skeptical of the UN's climate models and the UN's uh, uh, you know ideas about CO2 causing catastrophic global warming. Uh, and I did get some very positive responses about your work, uh, Dr. Nikolov. But then, of course, we also got some that uh, just dismissed it out of hand. It was so outside of the box. But Darwin, let's turn to you. Uh, what are the implications of this? I mean, let, let's just say it's true. What, what, what does that mean for the world? What does that mean for the United Nations? What does that mean for all of this federal policy supposedly designed to stop global warming? I mean, what are the implications of this? Well, the implications are that we're wasting money on a, on a problem that doesn't exist. CO2 is just not a problem in the atmosphere because that's not what controls what controls the temperature. And, you know, I'd like to point out that, uh, you know, there's other issues associated with uh, climate like precipitation. And uh, I think we mentioned to you that uh, Professor John Kleppe gave a, a, a paper at the American Geophysical Union in December showing that uh, solar magnetic cycles have a major effect on our on our precipitation in California. So Professor Kleppe has probably got the longest precipitation record in one place of anybody in the planet. And uh, what he's shown is that, uh, it, I should go back, he, he's about 20 years ago, he discovered trees buried in, in, in the bottom of Fallen Leaf Lake, which is a very deep lake. It's about, I don't know, 150, 200 feet deep. And basically, uh, those trees started growing about a thousand years ago. In other words, Fallen Leaf Lake was nearly dry. 
And, uh, and then uh, and that drought lasted for close to 200 years. Now that's pretty much accepted science these days. Uh, and so the question is, why did it happen? And so Dr. Kleppe started studying uh, the sun cycles and not just sunspots, but it turns out there's like three signals that basically modulate our climate our, uh, from a precipitation standpoint. One is the circulation of our atmosphere. Another is the flipping of the sun's magnetic field every 11 years. And the third one that was really interesting is the thing called the Gleisberg cycle. And this was uh, sort of discovered, I think, back in the 40s, where there's a, between a 30 and 100 year cycle and that has an effect on our precipitation. We don't understand why. And then there's another aspect of the Gleisberg cycle called the Hallstatt cycle that has like a 3000 year period. And uh, until Dr. Kleppe uh, used those signals in processing his precipitation data, he couldn't see the drought that he, that he had discovered a thousand years ago. And as soon as he put that uh, information into his model, it popped out. So if you look at uh, on our website, which is uh, www.climate-veritas.com, there's extensive information on all of this, including uh, Dr. Nikolaus' work and Dr. Kleppi's work. And basically what Dr. Kleppi showed is that uh, he can, with about a 70% confidence level, show the, uh, the droughts that occurred in the 30s in the United States. There was a drought, I don't know, in the late 1800s, 1870, I believe. And those show up in that data that he's processed. And uh, it also is connected to the uh, uh, El Nino and El Nina uh, uh, phenomenon. Again, not, it's not totally clear why, but it's in the record. It's in the precipitation record that he's been studying for over 20 years. So it's it's really revolutionary stuff, Alex, and um, it's uh, very few people have have bothered to learn about it. Although, you know, Professor Kleppe may be doing some work with New South Wales, Australia, to try and help them understand: Are they going to have a drought or lots of rain in the coming years? But it's uh, it's really groundbreaking work. Yeah, it is fascinating. And, and one of the scientists that I reached out to when I first came across your paper, Dr. Nikolov, was uh, Dr. Nils Axel Morner. He's now passed away, but um, I was a big fan of his. Uh, he was uh, uh, one of the reviewers for the sea level section of the UN IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, he was also the head of the Paleo Geophysics and Geodynamics Department at Stockholm University. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to him. And one of the things he told me about your paper, he says, the paper by Nikolov and Zeller is exceptionally interesting a big step forward and probably a door opener to a new paradigm. Uh, also, Professor Philip Lloyd at the Energy Institute at South Africa's Cape Peninsula University of Technology said this is very inter interesting. He thinks the underlying physics is sound. Um, Dr. Nikola, we're down to just a few minutes left, but uh, you say that one of the mistakes that the uh, proponents of the greenhouse gas theory have made is that they just forgot that the atmosphere didn't have a roof and didn't have walls on it. Uh, if you can condense that into a couple minutes, just explain to the folks uh, what that means. Well, basically the greenhouse, the real greenhouse works because it has walls and a roof and the, the air is trapped inside. That's how the greenhouse keeps warm. It doesn't keep warm because it traps infrared radiation. They claim the atmosphere traps infrared radiation and it's impossible in an open system to trap heat of any kind because the system is open. This is according to the second law of thermodynamics. It's a physical law. Um, and so uh, the atmosphere doesn't have any roof on it, so therefore it could not trap heat. The reason we have a higher temperature on the surface here compared to the temperature of the moon, which is the same distance from the sun, actually it absorbs more radiation because it doesn't have any cloud cover to reflect back. Uh, the, the reason why the Earth is much warmer, and it's warmer by something like 88 to 90 degrees Kelvin, warmer than the moon, it's because of the atmospheric pressure that enhances the energy that's coming from the sun, that's absorbed from the sun. So the pressure acts like a magnifying glass, if you want, uh, if you will. It, it enhances whatever is there. If you move the Earth to the orbit of Titan, you know, Saturn, you know, uh, down there, it will be very cold. It will become very cold because the pressure itself does not create the heat. The pressure just enhances like a magnifying glass, like, you know, on Earth is like 45% enhancement of whatever comes from the sun. So, you know, 
the thermal effect of the atmosphere on Earth being like 80, 88 to 90 degree Kelvin, it depends uh, on how far you're from the sun. If you move the Earth away from the sun, then all of a sudden this difference will be not anymore 90 degrees. The thermal effect will be like, you know, 30 degrees or something like that, right? So the sun is still the primary source of energy. The pressure serves as a magnifying glass to, to amplify that. This is how the compression works. It's called, technical term is adiabatic heating. Adiabatic means by the force of pressure itself without any input of additional heat. All right, Just very good. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but Darwin, I want to give you the last word here. Uh, what are the next steps for you guys to get the word out about this, and where can people learn more about this uh, work? Well, first of all, we have a website. It's www.climate-veritas.com. And the other thing we're doing is we're sending letters to basically all of the legislators in, in, uh, in Washington to explain to them that they're wasting money because this, this CO2 is just not controlling our climate. Uh, we're also contacting secretaries of state around the, around the country and uh, a number of newspapers to try and start gets, to get some publicity uh, for this work that uh, both Dr. Kleppe and, uh, and Dr. Nikolov have done, because it's, brown, it's groundbreaking work. I mean, I just watched a, a video of, of uh, pr uh, Professor Kunin speaking in Paris in March, and he starts out and says, well, you know, the reason that CO2 is a problem because, well, it started to happen, the temperature started to go up 160 years ago, and that's when the Industrial Revolution started. And so it has to be CO2. Well, if you look at uh, Dr. Nikolov's work, he shows that basically it's uh, uh, the change in albedo over the last 160 years that's really uh, been the warming factor. Yep. Uh, gentlemen, we are out of time, but I want to thank you both for coming on. Darwin Throne and Dr. Ned Nikolov, thank you so much for your work. Uh, really appreciate you coming on. Hopefully we'll get you back for another longer segment at some point in the future. Thank you, gentlemen. Yep, thank, thank you. you. All righty, folks, we are out of time. And you know what? I'm not a scientist. I don't know whether they are correct or not, but these things deserve to be considered. They deserve to be taken seriously. So uh, if you know anybody who could benefit from this, send them over to there. Um, you know, so far, nobody's been able to, uh, to adequately explain these findings that they have, and somebody needs to explain it, right? Uh, so I'm Alex Newman. This is the Sentinel Report. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, 